The title for the fastest man or woman on earth belongs to whoever owns the 100 meter sprint time. Why? Because it is the benchmark for all out running speed. And off and running. Asafa Powell gets a good start. Usain Bolt in the middle is now exploding. Jamaican sprinter Usain Bolt is the fastest man on earth with an official world record time of 9.58 seconds in the 100 meter dash. At his fastest, he's running more than 27 miles per hour. Elite sprinters look like they leave it all on the track. But could they eke out just a little bit more, somehow? Today, we're gonna look at why running a 100 meter dash in nine seconds flat is almost impossible. To find out what it takes, I towed the line with two of America's top sprinters, <laughs> ran on an absurd treadmill, and talked physiological limits with a biomechanist. The determinants of how fast you can complete a 100 meters are you know, how quickly you get up to speed and then how fast you can run once you get there, basically. Yeah, yeah. make sure they're all around the pedal. All the way on the, the, pedal. the pedal. Yeah. All right. I got a lesson in getting up to speed from two of the fastest runners on Earth, Mike Rogers and Bryce Robinson. And then for the setup, obviously you want your fingers behind the line. Rogers, an Olympian, has clocked a 9.85 second 100 meter time. Robinson, a rising track star, is also one of the few sprinters to have run the 100 meter dash in under 10 seconds. They showed me how to set up the blocks for a good start. Set. It was only so much help. Go! <laughs> okay, what did they do right? Came out the blocks, he did that. <laughs> Got in correctly, pushed out. But the, the release from the pedals, you gotta work on that part. Set. I was basically Go. falling forward and flailing. <laughs> when you got out, you look straight up. <laughs> trying to see, yeah. The, the step. Yeah. You're trying to catch yourself, yeah. which is normal. Pass class one. This is class two. All right. Get push out, Bryce. See? So he's dragging his back foot. That foot drag forces Robinson to keep his rear foot planted on the block longer. And that gives him a more explosive start. He also swings his arms for maximum power. The, the drag comes in because you're trying to push off this thing as long as you can. You don't want to you don't want to step off this thing without pushing. This time I'm going to set up exactly how I did the first time. I'll get set and then I'm going to focus on two things. One is going to be this toe drag uh, coming off on my left foot, yeah. right? Because I want to be on that block for as long as possible. Yeah. And that kind of forces me to do that. Yeah. Yeah. That also has a secondary effect of keeping me lower, right? Yes. Yeah. And the third thing I'm going to focus on is Move my arms. Yeah. Go. Ah. <laughs> that was better than the first time. Yeah, yeah. After the lesson, I asked them to race. But it was early in the season, and these guys weren't about to blow out a hamstring going full tilt for 100 meters against a guy like me. But as you can see, they really didn't have to. They had me beat the moment we left the blocks. They weren't even trying. Which is obvious. They're two of the fastest people on Earth. But why are they so fast? Really great position. To find out, I talked to this guy. One side, the heel recovery issues are almost irrelevant. I'm Peter Wayne, I'm the director of the Locomotor Performance Lab here at SMU, where we study the mechanical and physiological basis of human performance. He invites world-class athletes like Robinson and Rogers, and not so world-class athletes like me, to run and be studied at his lab in Dallas. How? with a lot of really cool and really expensive equipment. We have some high-tech custom toys, a force instrumented treadmill, and ultra high-speed cameras uh, with uh, motion detection capabilities that are very precise. His research shows that the key to elite sprinting is how much force you can put into the ground and how fast. Usain Bolt or another elite male sprinter at top speed will put down five times their body weight typically in 0.09 seconds or nine hundredths of a second. If a person can put out those kinds of forces, they have a shot at earning a place on the lab's record board. These are the records. So 11.72 for a guy, that's, that's cooking. It's smoking, yeah. Do you, know, do you know about what that translates to in miles per hour? Uh, just under 27. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. That's amazing. What's, what's a respectable, what's, a, what, what's like... I would say and like you're not being polite. Or I would say anything, you know, eight, eight and a half would be pretty respectable. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna shoot for respectable. Got my socks. Speaking of respectability, William had me put on a shorts. ridiculously tight outfit. Let's go do it. Then I got marked up with infrared dots and strapped into a safety harness to run on the lab's force sensing treadmill. Why the harness? Just listen to this thing. It sounds like a jet taking off. It can go 90 miles per hour. 
Wayan had me warm up, first with a jog, then he had me run at four meters per second, it's about an eight minute mile, five meters per second, about a five and a half minute mile, and then... So this treadmill is moving at 6.7 meters per second. That translates to exactly 15 miles per hour, which translates exactly to a four minute mile pace. I got to feel like Roger Bannister for about two seconds. Whenever you're ready, Robbie. Finally, I topped out at eight meters per second, which is just shy of 18 miles per hour. Good! That's right at the threshold. <laughs> we had the treadmill set to 8.1 meters per second. Yep. I was doing my best to keep up with it, but I was drifting back a little bit. Drifted, I think we said 20 centimeters, which means I was actually running at around eight flat. Right about. Right okay, about. so how does that compare to a world-class sprinter? So, not bad, not bad. It's a, it's a respectable speed, and uh, an elite sprinter, a male, will hit, you know, somewhere around 11 and a half or so. Fastest ever recorded speed is 12.4 from Usain Bolt, 12.4 meters per second. That kind of speed is what propelled Bolt to his world record time of 9.58 seconds. The 100 meter dash. But 50 years ago, the great barrier for sprinting was a 10 second 100 meter dash. sprinters to win, equaling the world record of 10 seconds flat. In 1968, American Jim Hines burst across the line in 9.95 seconds. His record stood for 15 years. Since then, sprinters have been whittling away hundreds of a second at a time. Track surfaces have improved, training's gotten better, and sprinters these days wear these really tight outfits. And that helps with wind resistance. As athletes seek every advantage, timing and verification technology have also gotten more sophisticated. Any record set with a tailwind greater than two meters per second doesn't count. But Wayan says there aren't many ways for athletes to get faster. And that's because of basic physics. Sort of in big picture science, how fast humans can run 100 meters is really, uh, it's, it's, a, it's all force in relation to body mass. So we use, use the analogy of athletes as being force application machines. And force in relation to mass is what determines how quickly a sprinter can accelerate. It's what de determines their top speed. And there are intrinsic constraints on force. Remember, it's all about maximizing your force in as little time as possible. Let's look at how that concept applies over the course of a race, starting in the blocks. So there's the initial push out of the blocks, which is really dependent upon athletes' muscular force or strength capabilities. And they, they get up to almost one third of their top speed before their foot initially hits the ground. So by far, that's the greatest portion of acceleration. I saw this happen firsthand as Robinson and Rogers blasted away from the start line and from me. And then there's a transition phase where what they do step to step changes a little bit in terms of how much force they can apply. They can apply progressively more as they, as they go step by step further into the race. But they're typically by step 12 or so, they're 85, 90% of their max speed. It doesn't take very long. That max speed is what Wayand examines in short bursts at his lab. And there, the mechanical determinant is no longer sort of their int intrinsic strength, but, but rather it's, it's the motion. It's that their mechanics or technique of sprinting to drive the limb down into the ground forcefully. They essentially throw a quick, sharp punch at the ground, and that, that maximizes their force capabilities. And then the last 30 meters of the race, they typically slow down, and they do so because uh, muscle fatigues very rapidly, and the period of time that they can sustain their top speed is very short. It's less than a couple of seconds. Wayne looks at the forces an athlete applies during their run. And it's in these numbers that you can really see why an elite sprinter is so much faster. Once they get rolling, the force on the ground, and again, the, what they're better doing than everyone else is applying force in the time available. Uh, the force on the ground becomes a motion-based mechanism where they use their limbs to throw a punch at the ground. Let's look at how much more of a punch a pro can give the ground. On the left is me, running at 7.82 meters per second. And on the right is Robinson, doing 10.85 meters per second. I'm hitting the ground as hard as I can to keep up with the treadmill, with a force roughly three times my body weight. Robinson weighs about as much as I do, but he's throwing almost five times his body weight at the ground, and he's doing it way faster than I can. And that weight is key. Look what happens when you take away gravity. This is Usain Bolt running in a microgravity airplane, and even he can't generate any push. Back on Earth, that raw strength has to be precisely applied to the track, and that's form. 
Look at how much higher Robinson brings his heels and his knees on each stride. Those mechanics are what allow him to maximize the force his legs deliver to the ground and clock 100 meter times just under 10 seconds. Of course, he'd like to get even faster. When you're training this season, is there a benchmark you're shooting for or are you just kind of trying to get the best you can? Man, I, I, I really want to run 9.8 this year, this upcoming year. If uh, God willing it, it's faster than that, I'll be, I'll be happy, but I really want to run really uh, 9.8. If I, if I get that, which um, the, the main goal is to run 9.9s consistently. I run 9.9s consistently, then that 9.8 will pop out there every once in a while. At some point it will. But what if a sprinter wanted to go a lot faster? say, nine seconds flat. Wayne's research shows that the human body would have to exert forces greater than have ever been recorded at speeds that probably aren't possible. So typically, at top speed, they'll put, they'll put a force into the ground that peaks at five times their body weight, and they'll have a foot ground contact time or period of force application that's typically 0.09 seconds or 9 hundredths of a second. Uh, on the very short end, 0.085 seconds. To get to what would be required for nine flat, they would have to approach six times body weight and a foot ground contact time of just over seven hundredths of a second. So we're not gonna see anyone blast across the line in nine seconds in the 100 meter dash. But that doesn't mean a sprinter couldn't cover that distance that fast. In fact, some of them already have. So if you remove the acceleration requirement from a stationary start from the race and you allow a flying start coming in, uh, humans are comfortably under the nine second barrier already. World record for four by 100 meter relay held by the Jamaicans is about 36.7 or eight seconds. So essentially each person after the one that ran the opening leg had to average you know, nine flat for their 100 meter segments for them to run that fast. But the start is part of what makes the 100 meter dash so thrilling. Like on that last run, you were first out of the blocks by a mile. Yeah. And then you, you were ahead of me, and then I was bringing up the rear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's right out of the blocks. You guys are both beating me really fast. Yeah. <laughs> That's nuts. Now, some of that has to do with their raw strength, but it also has to do with their incredible reaction times. So do you practice on reaction time stuff at all? We do. Under current rules, if a sprinter moves before the starting gun, they're automatically disqualified. This actually happened to Usain Bolt at the World Championships in 2011. What I like to do is close my eyes and first thing I hear, I move. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's, that, that'll help you alleviate fall start and stuff like that. You don't hear nothing, you don't move. But here's the thing. An athlete can also be disqualified for leaving the blocks less than a tenth of a second after the gun goes off. The reasoning is that a reaction time of less than 0.1 seconds is physiologically impossible. But research shows some sprinters may actually be capable of reaction times as quick as 0.08 seconds. I close my eyes because I used to keep them open and people, people flinch and do all that, all the weird stuff. And I'm a, I feel like I'm a pretty aware person, so I kind of notice that stuff and I'll, go, I'll be hesitant to go because right. of it. So what is actually possible for the 100 meter dash? And does anybody stand a chance at breaking Bolt's record? I would say if, if you put together a perfect human being who's you know, exceptional and a perfect race, you know, I think certainly something in the 940 range, low 940s, maybe a little bit faster than that, under currently legal conditions should be possible. So keep watching. We're probably never gonna see a nine second 100 meter dash. But remember that what these athletes are doing is already almost impossible.